no. Do let me know. Is that working okay? Yep, great, wonderful. Okay. So, as Peter alluded to, wandering the sort of many quaint parish churches and even our sort of gigantic cathedrals and ancient landscapes of Britain, we're surrounded by the many religious institutions that our modern faith was built upon. Many such edifices now stand as ruins, even empty reminders of an era of religious life so grand yet so ephemeral, and many do not. Some still, though, are decaying fragments in the landscape, silencing the familiarity of the past, and indeed, many aren't. Yet they once housed what can be argued as the main pillar of the religion of our medieval past, that is, the cults and the relics, indeed, of saints. And to them, virtually every level of society journeyed. This was known as pilgrimage. While the majority of the tombs, shrines, and reliquary caskets that once housed saints' bodies are now gone, forever lost to history, many of the routes leading to them still survive as pilgrim routes or just walking routes and have resonance with pilgrims and tourists in the same way to this very day. So before we continue though, what really is a saint? The OED, for example, defines a saint as a person of exalted virtue who is canonized by the church after death and who may be the object of veneration and prayers for intercession, so on our behalf. Wannabe saints were, and indeed still are, required to shuffle off their mortal coils to be in the running for full canonized status. And there's no fast pass to sainthood either. The process is lengthy, often taking decades, even centuries to complete. On average, the wheels don't even start turning until five years post-mortem to allow greater balance and objectivity in identifying um, and evaluating the case of sainthood. And saints generally fall into two categories based on their holy actions. The first group are the martyrs. They show willingness to be put to a violent death for refusing to announce Christ. The deacon of Jerusalem, St. Stephen, for example, he was the first Christian martyr who ended being stoned to death for blasphemy against the Jewish temple. Not quite what anyone has in mind on a Sunday, during a Sunday service, no doubt. And then we have the confessors. As the name suggests, conf they confess the virtues of a Christian life to a valorous degree. This is somewhat the secondary. The confessors are, take somewhat of an easier route as they don't actually have to die for their faith, but they are witnesses to it under difficult and often dangerous circumstances. But as luck would have it, there are now another two ways to reach that divine goal, that celebrity A-list. Exceptional cases are based on the confirmation of an already widespread venerable reputation. So you need to have done a lot of good deeds. And this one tends to be used sparingly like Mother Teresa or Hildegard of Bingen, whose holiness were known worldwide before. In 2017 though, Pope Francis created a final category the laying down of one's life for others. And this tied up any loose ends for those who might be sort of martyrs for love. But in the Middle Ages, saints were effectively the superheroes or celebrities of European culture. Though ordinary humans, they had performed extraordinary actions, which made them, which made them extraordinary indeed, and therefore they could use their powers to help and protect the vulnerable. The lives and the afterlives, so during their life and posthumously, these were written down, their tales were written as stories known as hagiographies. And they were also illustrated, both the lives and deaths and post-mortem, were illustrated across various mediums from stained glass to wall paintings. And these became the focus of prayer and pilgrimage, hence why we still have so many left in our parish churches. In effect, saints were the role models of medieval society. And better still, they offered intercessory powers for the faithful. In return for their commitment, this faith, these faithful, so pilgrims, would visit their tombs, or devotees would visit their tombs, their shrines and their reliquaries, reliquary caskets, for many purposes, ranging from the possibility of miraculous intervention by the saints, whose shrines they were venerating, for perhaps for indulgences, so offering money usually for the remission through purgatory, cures of illnesses perhaps, or hopes even for a better har harvest, or even simply 
they might have gone to visit them just for a day out, a sort of form of historical tourism, been there, done that, if you will. In general, though, most pilgrims didn't seek to make pilgrimages in expectation of miracles, as we often attribute to with so many saints, but for more everyday eases and cures in a world without sort of scientific responses and medicine, if you will. Though, however, marketing the efficacy of saints' powers by touting their miracle tales helped churches' ability to attract pilgrims in what was a truly competitive market. And we're going to see exactly how that worked. Subsequently, medieval pilgrimage, pilgrimage included any journey undertaken for specifically religious purpose, and it usually involved an overnight stay at a pilgrimage center. Canon law, so church law, defined it as a mandatory journey imposed for penance, for wrongdoing of, or a voluntary act, which involved a preliminary vow, and both had to be undertaken in the appropriate manner, carrying the pilgrim's insignia of scrip, so a bag, and staff, stick. And you would have to go to your parish church, your priest would bless your impending journey, and you would put your scrip and your staff on the altar where, again, it would be blessed. So this was very much a rite of passage, a ritualistic praxis. Evidence suggests many journeys, though, many pilgrimages, were actually very short. And so those long-haul pilgrimages we often think of, such as the Canterbury Tales, or to Santiago de Compostela in Spain, or Rome Lords, wherever it might, might have been, were the exception, really, rather than the rule. Additionally, the majority of lay pilgrims did not go on many pilgrimages during their lifetime. Some may have journeyed to a cult site only once in their life, whilst cult churches often restricted the days on which your lay pilgrims and your everyday pilgrims could visit. And these were often the major feast days, although for a royal or elite visitor, such restrictions were overlooked. As such, the acquisition of relics was vital to the income of the church. And it was believed that the possession of saintly relics increased a, a church's spiritual authenticity. Deriving from the Latin reliquum, meaning remainder, so leftover, the real value of these divine articles, or their authenticity, lay in their power to bridge between heaven and earth. So they were the connection between man, woman, and the divine. During times of crisis, famine, plague, harvest, poverty, and illness, the saints were therefore solicited as faithful servants to ease everyday maladies, and promises of protection were sought from their relics with the utmost fervour. So people would travel hundreds of miles, or even a few miles, on pilgrimage, on pilgrimage, flocking to parish churches and cathedrals to glimpse, touch, even kiss the physical remains of a saint or a holy person. In essence, the closer to a relic, the more likely a miracle would be granted. So virtually every medieval church went on to possess a corpse, of a saint, either intact or just a fragment of bone, hair or flesh believed to be powerfully active. Of course, not all hallowed heirlooms were considered equal. Those at the top of the pecking order would work their sacred magic most quickly and effectively. Uh, with the power declining, the more disconnected the relic was from the associated individual. So the blood, bones, or hair of martyrs, apostles, or Christ, were considered to have the greatest power, and they were known as the first class relics, the most iconic being the, the true cross, Christ's true cross. Second class relics were garments or personal property belonging to the holy individual. And then we had third class relics, and they were objects or places touched by or within the vicinity of a first or second class relic. So usually where a saint had lain or he'd been or an object associated with him was or her was and this is a hierarchy that still exists to this day so essentially the more relics a church had the more people i.e pilgrims were likely to come and visit it and that meant more people who could come to the shrine come to the relic and donate an offering in the hope of a cure or a miracle whatever the reason may be so think of this like the modern day theme park those with the more adventurous and numerous rides draw the greater crowds. Parish churches, monasteries and cathedrals therefore all vied for pilgrim's custom with sacred relics or failing that a locally associated saint was very much an in-demand entity. 
People would travel, as I've said, far and wide just to get a glimpse of these shining beacons of faith, these shrines and reliquaries of saints, due to the promises that they held of hope or the ridding of sins. In fact, many modern business practices were used by pilgrim centres. We can see that. Active brand management and promotional techniques were adopted, operating within what was a highly competitive market for pilgrim services. And moreover, an entire infrastructure, an entire enterprise, if you will, emerged around the acquisition of relics and obtaining, essentially, the best of the bunch. So here's a great tale about how this worked right up into the 20th century, in fact. So the year was 869, and England was about to fall foul to a great heathen force of Danes led by what we know, who we know as Ivor the Bonus. As they pillaged their way through the country, they landed upon the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of East Anglia, and there at Thetford seized its ruler, Edmund. He refused to govern as a Viking un underking, and so was tied to a tree and beaten before his final breath was taken by a volley of arrows. But his body was not yet spared of the torment. No, his head was subsequently hacked off and tossed into a bramble bush. Edmund was the last of the Wafinga dynasty of East Anglia, and while possibly fabricated throughout later chronicles, the Danes then allegedly performed the ghastly blood eagle on him, a rite in which the living victim had his ribs and lungs spread apart like an eagle's wings. He was buried in the nearby town, which is now Bury St Edmunds, and canonised a short while later. Such was his following that Edmund was soon recognised as England's patron saint a position held until he was overthrown by St. George on Edward III's orders in the early 15th century. In 1216, though, after King John rene reneged on Magna Carta, the country fell into civil war as the so-called Barons' War broke out. John died in 1216, with the throne passing to his nine-year-old son, Henry III. To overcome stalemate, the Barons offered the throne of England to Louis, the Dauphin of France, later Louis VIII. Alas, England was not to become part of France. With the success of royalist forces, Louis allegedly wreaked vengeance. He returned home with England's most precious relic, precious natural treasure, should I say, the body of the saint who had become the traditional protector of the people's rights, Edmund. His relics were never seen again and everyone remained quiet. In 1901, the Archbishop of Westminster requested the return of Edmund's relics so that they might grace the high altar of the new cathedral, but Toulouse, where the relics had been housed, refused. On appeal, the Pope sided with the Archbishop and Edmund's body alone was returned. His decapitated head remained in France. Yet following doubt over the authenticity of the relics sent back, his bodily remains were left in the care of the Duke of Norfolk, and so apparently still remain in the private chapel at Arundel Castle. So although extraordinary, this story is not uncommon. The medieval market for relics was big business, and indeed still is. It was, there was a huge in, uh, industry with an infrastructure to match, from peasant to pope, all clamoured to see them. So much so that Charlemagne even ordered relics Relic veneration to be an integral part of Frankish canon law, and he directed every altar to possess their own set of relics. So the pilgrimage trade had an enormous impact on local economies, leading both cathedrals and parish churches to go to extreme lengths in pursuit of the best relics, the most desirable being the most difficult to come by, obviously, and so these would attract the most visitors. Acquiring prime relics required much time and money. So competition between sacred sites to outdo one another drove many churches to extreme, even inexplicable lengths. Fragments of saints were trafficked around Europe at alarming rates, but far too often supply simply fell behind demand. In the quest therefore to acquire these relics, an underground economy sprang up. These were known as relic merchants usually. And there was a huge business of trading or surreptitiously buying, even stealing relics. Relic thefts, in fact, were highly organised affairs. But although high ranking churchmen could technically place orders, they often couldn't afford to pay for them. And so the astronomical prices of these most prized cho cho choices 
just went up and up and up, leading to more of these surreptitious practices. Perhaps unsurprisingly, after England's break with Rome in the mid 16th century, many of the relics were proven to be forgeries because of this, because so many churches wanted these. Some were seen as duck's blood, some were spice and herb concoctions, although they did continue to be venerated um, as imbued with divine powers that could transform or cure, which is quite interesting. Double selling was even authorised as well, if the relic mongers were talented or duplicitous enough. Accordingly, this traffic in so-called holy antiques became so prevalent that churches overflowed with these types of bogus relics that I just mentioned. The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 did order pilgrims not to be deceived by them, but problems, of course, persisted due to this insatiable demand. The stereotypical partner in Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, laden with you know, pig's bones, these counterfeit relics, in turn for receipts awarded as remission of sin, known as indulgences, emerged due to this endemic corruption. The biggest clue that relics were fake came when several sites often laid claim to the same relic, often with versions running into the double digits. Countless sites claimed pieces of wood as shards of the true cross, with no fewer than 29 asserting possession of the associated nails of Christ on the cross, so he must have had very many limbs. And in fact, in reality, when pieced together, um, those pieces of the shards of the true cross would have probably, as 16th century Protestant theologian John Calvin quipped, have formed an entire ship's cargo. Indeed, the cross probably would have been the size of the British Isles. This led to some sites, such as Sens Cathedral, which owned hundreds of relics, to give their sacred artifacts an authenticity tag, similar to modern antiquities practices. Thus, relics were venerated in churches and shrines constructed to house these sacred remains. With time, the clothing and personal effects of holy men and women were also enshrined and ornate reliquaries created to display and preserve them. This was the result of wide spread belief in the wonder working power of the saints that was found in every part of their body and in objects as I noted that had been in contact with the divine. Christian belief in the afterlife and resurrection led to the relics rivaling even the sacraments in the Middle Ages as they impacted virtually all aspects of daily life. As such the relationship between pilgrim and church was far more advanced than perhaps we we can appreciate in the modern day. Medieval devotees, medieval pilgrims, not only visited these sites, but they experienced the vibrant array of sculptures, shrines, artifacts, monuments, images, etc., with interactions moving them physically, emotionally, and mentally. Participating in a venerable experience involved a sort of holistic use of the senses. Engagement was inherent, ranging from the burning of incense and candles, or the sight of the vestments and paintings, to the oral sounds of the churches. Stimulation of the senses was inescapable. As a result, the sort of engaging aspects, the active aspects, the sensory aspects, if you will, of devotional art and architecture, or pilgrimage art and architecture of the churches, was not coincidental. But in fact, this infrastructure, these schemes, were designed for interaction. And as such, patron and artist had an underlying interest in creating works that inspired and heightened reactions to create an ultimate faithful devotional experience. Works were designed with specific interactive goals in mind so that the shrines and churches overall indeed could physically and mentally touch, communicate and enforce understanding through assertive reciprocal performative means using lots of images, sounds and smells. And in fact, in his Apologia of 1125, Bernard of Clairvaux highlighted the importance of these aids when he stated, quote, we know that the bishops use material beauty to arouse the devotion of a carnal people because they cannot do so by spiritual means. So this all arose, this sort of need for engagement arose from the need, another need or requirement to touch and be touched by the holy by such objects and structures, which was generated through this pilgrimage process. In turn, the construction, embellishment and development of saintly receptacles and tombs and shrines and such like were a continual part of this process. 
Relics and shrines had a multitude of purposes during the Middle Ages. They were the reason for the cults, the reason for the devotion. But essentially, they determined the architectural form of the church, including its interior arrangements, its decoration, and its display. For example, the plans of church buildings demanded movement via certain routes, while art and architecture concealed and even revealed to pilgrims en route through both two and three dimensional outputs. In this way, complex and theological discourses could be grasped through a sort of active, a visual, a sensory engagement by pilgrims who were turning the church into a sort of institution of performance with the building acting as a spatial arena through which this process could evolve. Devotion towards the saints, therefore, was designed to convey a drama and a spiritual captivation. Pilgrimage, in fact, was described commonly as seeing with the senses, deriving from the early Christian desire to visit Jerusalem in order to see and touch places where Christ was believed to be physically present. The devotional act of pilgrim veneration was therefore a very physical affair, with touching, kissing, as I've noted, even crawling into these shrine structures being a common practice in order to come into direct contact with the saint, with their intercessory power. Indeed, the closer you were to a relic, the quicker that should occur. Expressions of this type of worship have therefore been uncovered, if you will, they can be seen throughout the designs of the architectural and decorative schemes of cult churches where shrines were. And they permeate the sacred locales of the shrines and tomb structures themselves. Trends in tomb and shrine design really do echo this. So in a nutshell, uh, the sort of designs we had in the medieval era included either the stone plinth above the original burial site with the beer. So we see this with St. Thomas Beckett here, um, the beer, the reliquary casket or ferritrum placed on a supporting stone base of columns. Or we have the foramina design containing a solid base pierced by large portal-esque openings. And you can see me getting into one there in the middle of the slide at Salisbury Cathedral. By the mid 13th century, tomb shrines enabled interaction with the saint to be more carefully stage managed, however. The foramina developed with the introduction of the highly decorated solid base plinth raised on a dais by several steps and pierced with two to three feet shallower niches in which praying pilgrims could rest, kneel, sorry, and rest their elbows. So you can see that at St. William's Shrine and also St. Edward the Confessors. They could also touch and kiss the reliquary casket, getting as close as they could to it. So sainthood, um, though, necessitated the physical elevation of relics above the ground, the removal of the bodily remains from the original interred burial site, and therefore translation into a raised reliquary vessel, an embellished shrine and surrounding architectural locale. So this process of the translation, the raising, is why we often get, for example, St. Thomas Beckett's tomb and then a shrine, or tomb and then a shrine. In fact, the height at which bones were placed or shrine monuments constructed was directly re often related to the saint's importance and no doubt a way to raise a patron saint above its competition due to the burgeoning canonization of relics. So they were physically raising it through better shrine structures. Although the actual relics were concealed in caskets, the ferritra, which these could be carved or they could be painted wood or even gilded, the shrines themselves grew in spiritual importance. They served as conduits, if you will, for the saint's intercession. The evidence for pilgrims touching and even sleeping underneath them suggests that direct physical engagement with the holy was therefore an increasingly important aspect of their construction, and perhaps even more increasingly so as we move through the Middle Ages. The reliquary, cask the reliquary caskets of some shrines were also revealed only at certain times of the day by pulley systems, which lifted canopies decorated with bells that rang out into the entire body of the church. And we know of St. Thomas Beckett's two, uh, shrine at Canterbury and St. Uh, Cuthbert's at Durham. These are two examples where, um, where this practice would occur. Moreover, ritual entrances and exits were located to create specific pilgrim routes or attractions, if you will, within the church building again similar to a modern type theme park while strategically placed associated art and sculpture was located along the routes designed to be seen 
or worshipped at and associated with the saint. And I'll come on to show how this works in a moment. Nonetheless, as John Crook claims, no cult could be successful if it did not appeal to the heart of pilgrimage, a sense of contact with the saint. So numerous sacred components were created and they were created to form an embodied type of experience as different emotions and intern experiences were provided by different parts of the shrine's fabric, immortalizing the, the saint's majesty and power and authenticated and projected the sanctity of the relics of the saint. More simply, following Matthew Johnson's premise, people created the church as much as the church created people. And we're going to see that now in practical form. So here we have St. Neot Church in Cornwall. Upon entry through the doorway, there's an overwhelming sort of immediacy of all the sensory aspects of this pilgrim scheme, this pilgrim route associated with St. Neot. Immediately, the life of the St. Neot window located in the westernmost light of the north aisle directly opposite the south door would have been apparent. And it acted as somewhat as a signpost or presencing device for the location of the pilgrimage route within the church. And this is, so you can see as you walk in here, it, the window is pretty much opposite where you would have walked in. After seeing Neat's life narrated in the glass panels, pilgrims would then have been directed to the location of the shrine via the wooden roof bosses above them. And you can see, I'll just go back, this is the 14th century, what we think is the 14th century shrine of St. Cuthbert. There's a little squint in the corner. Um, it was, um, uh, became, it later became an Easter sepulchre, um, but we think that before his, before St. Neot's relics were transferred to the Huntingdonshire um, Priory, that he remained in here and then perhaps his arm bone or finger bone of his was left in order for veneration to still occur. You can see there's also a wall painting on the back there um, on the recess niche which we think is a Christ in majesty, Christ in blessing, very faded even though I have looked at it in detail but then this was later um, as I say became an Easter sepulchre, uh, yeah an Easter sepulchre but we are assuming that this is his, his shrine. So moving on, originally these roof bosses, so as I say, these would have been along the top, so next to, um, next to the window running down that north aisle, and I'll come on and show you that in a little bit more detail. These would have been elaborately painted and therefore visually striking to the eye, making the procession from the window to the shrine much more obvious. Four bosses are sighted along a pair of principal rafters along the north aisle wagon roof, and they depict shorthand versions of a key aspect of the saint's hagiography. Saint Neot had found three fish in a nearby well, so the story goes, but was charged by an angel to take only one fish a day, and if he did so, he would ensure a never-ending food supply. When he fell sick, his servant, Barius, took two fish to tempt Neot to eat. One was served on a dish, while the other was left on a gridiron to continue cooking. Fortunately, the saint realized what had happened just in time, and the cooked fish were returned to the well where he came back to life. No, sorry, where they came back to life. The first two bosses show the three heads in swirling water, followed by one individual fish. The central boss, although damaged, is of just a floral design, perhaps a rose. And then finally, the fish on the gridiron, which is the bottom here, and the two fish served up on a bed of leaves complete the sequence. The symbolism of the gridiron is similarly reflected in the geometry of the wagon roof of molded ribs and the shield bearing angel bosses along the wall plate, which you can see here. Although the painted chancel roof is a 19th century reconstruction, it demonstrates how striking the colours of the original bosses would have been. Key to the hagiography of St. Neot, this symbolism even flows through to the central panel of the St. William window, sorry, the St. Neil window, as well as in the easternmost window of the North Isle. And there you would find the Tub family display, um, the Tub family arms, which have three Tub fish in relation, which links in the nearby Holy Well, in which the alleged three fish attributed to the narrative were thought to reside. So everything ties in here. Historian Joanna Mattingly's examination of the windows at St. Neot found that the position of the bosses was deliberately chosen 
for maximum effect as they were located directly above what's known as the sister's window, which was donated by the young women of the parish to the east of the St. Neot window. The miracle of the Fisher story is told in nearby panel four of St. Neot's window and then retold in a shorthand version on the bosses nearby. So the point here is that the bosses would have attracted the attention of those who had just viewed the, sh viewed the same story in the glass and therefore it was visually marked out through the bosses, through the glass, all the way along the route to the shrine, which is in the north wall of the chancel. So the roof bosses are there to mark out this roof shrine, uh, sorry, to mark out along the roof to the shrine, and the window is there to sort of signpost where you start, essentially, as you can see on the diagram here. Following these visual signposts, pilgrims would then process along the north aisle into the easternmost space of the church, so just behind the shrine. And then this is the area we think where the Tubb family arms are, um, the area where the early medieval hagiography states, pilgrims would wait to visit, would enter into the shrine area, sort of holding area, if you will. So you can see at the top where I've put the location of the Tubb and Calloway Chantry Chapel. They would wait here, then move through the archway and into the shrine area so they could visit the shrine. So the integrated relationship, I'll just go back there, the integrated relationship between the shrine painting, the, the shrine, the painting, the glass, the roof bosses, the surrounding art and architectural framework suggests these were all part of a wider coherent scheme which united the decorative elements to direct the pilgrim experience. During the late Middle Ages, it's clear that the aim of the interior of the church building was about far more than one. It was intended to impress by the stimulation of so many aspects, so many artistic, decorative, architectural aspects, or indeed we can just say indeed through many of these senses. In fact, expectation was created on immediate entry to the church by the shrine, an elaborate interior as well, and then anticipation was stimulated along the route to the main shrine as you're walking up underneath these roof bosses in the windows, and as you're interpreting the glass. And even as on your wait into to enter the chancel and visit the shrine. This then culminated in an overwhelming adulation as the shrine was visited and venerated in this area. As a result, the entire church itself became the shrine setting, not just the shrine, not just the area in front of it, but the entire church was a sort of macrocosmic shrine. Every area of the interior was aesthetically designed to create a unified appearance, a scheme, a cult scheme, if you will, cult of St. Neot scheme, that extended east and west, north and south, from the ceiling to the floor, linking each decorative and architectural element with the cult of the saint, here being St. Neot. And this was a really common occurrence within medieval parish churches. The reason being, the business of saints was truly at the heart of the medieval parish church. Thank you. Thank you so so much Emma, that was fascinating. Um, a couple of things there, I, you know, um, firstly I'm really really um, happy that you mentioned St Edmund. Um, those of you watching, some of you know that both St Edmund's is my hometown, so I'm a very very proud um, St Edmontonian. So um, yes, I see there are a couple of comments there that St Edmund should be our patron saint still. And I couldn't agree more with those comments. Um, and I know that at the Battle of Agincourt, it wasn't the flag of St. George that was carried into battle. It was the flag of St. Edmund, King and Martyr. Um, so um, we're actually doing a lecture on late St. Edmund and Bury St. Edmunds later on this year. Um, this year is the year of pilgrimage and the Abbey at Bury St. Edmunds is celebrating a really important milestone this year. So we're going to be putting on a lecture on later on this year um, to celebrate um, Bury St. Edmunds. So um, thank you, Emma, for that. Um, so we're about to go into question time. So um, please do use that comment box, um, type away any questions there. We've had quite a few come in already um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Before we go on though, I just want to mention that, again, accessing these lectures, they are 100% free. The only place you can access them on safely is on our Facebook page. So if anyone posts any links to a external website, do not click them. And especially if they're asking for card details, don't enter any because they are 100% free. We do not charge them. Um, and if you can't find a lecture, um, do give us a shout by direct messaging us and we'll send you a direct link securely.
Um, but Emma, we're going on to questions now. And as I said, there's been quite a few already. Um, so our first question is, I thought seeing Edward the Confessor was um, England's patron saint for a short while in between St. Edmund and St. George. Is that correct? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. My, not that, no, not that I'm aware of. But I'll do the research, you know. I certainly don't know everything, but not that I'm aware of. I can't. No, I, I mean, I know it was going from Edmund to... Um, Edmund to uh, George um, because of because of Edward but no I'm not going to no. well, we'll do some digging into that and um, do check the comment box and what we'll do is we'll comment um, a reply to your answer on the comment feature there um, the, the second question Emma um, is verification of relic authenticity was almost mm -hmm. impossible the relic trade sounds almost like the rhino horn and the pangolin trade going on illegally today how often and how many of these relics have been subjected to non-destructive analytical testing to go like the test run on the Turin Shroud, um, CT scanning, XRF, isotope analysis, or is it just really we accept it on faith alone? I, well, I couldn't entirely, I couldn't, I couldn't answer that question, um, to be honest, but I suppose we're looking, I would argue that we're looking at two different eras. So, in the Middle Ages, there was trial by fire, trial by water, so relics could be authenticated. Now, usually, um, relics were authenticated through miracles, and you know the church would say it was by miracles and miracle alone. Um, but that they were certainly um, you know, authent authenticated, if you will, by uh, you know if they if they essentially stayed in the form that they were, if you you know chuck them into water or you put them into fire or whatever. Um, but as we, as you'll have heard when I, when I said it in the talk, that much of this is based on faith, as I say, and faith alone. Later, we have testing when we got to the Reformation era as well. And that's how um, the blood of Hales was found to be a concoction of, um, um, oh gosh, what's the, um, what's the, hell? the uh, what was it, oil and um, the thing that turns things orange. <laughs> um saffron saffron that's it <laughs> a concoction of saffron mixed with uh was it honey honey and something else it was you know found to be a, a whole mixture so there's been different types of um testing throughout throughout the eras as of today it depends what it's done for and it's done in different ways but again how how do you authenticate a relic you could say that something is from that era or the era that it's supposed to be you know, originate from um it could be you know a female's bone if it's supposed to be female saint but it's difficult to do so. <laughs> uh, thanks emma and um another thing to quickly look at there for the person asking that question is um if you go on our page we a couple of weeks ago we posted a news item about um some testing that's recently been done at luca cathedral in tuscany um with what they call the volto santo the holy face of luca and they've actually found that it's an original um, carving, making it the oldest um, wooden sculpture um, in a Christian church in Europe. So do have a look at that because it's fascinating. That gives um, details of some of the scientific analysis that went into um, producing that. Um, third question, Emma. Um, have you published a book about saints or relics? Um, I have published a book on pilgrim routes of the British Isles which derives uh, which talks about much of this and lots of different articles um, etc so my my field of expertise and my, my monograph will be coming out based on my thesis which was on the sensory experience of pilgrimage art and architecture um, so when that comes around there will be sort of a sort of bigger book but you can find and much of what I've been much of what I've been talking about, I suppose, and why we have pilgrim routes today, how they sort of came about as well, because many of them are sort of interweaving tourist attractions, etc. But based on some sense of the the original pilgrim routes, so pilgrim routes to the British Isles is is you know most right. Right. Um, and do read that because someone who's recently bought that book, um, I'm very much enjoying it. So um, yeah, thumbs up review from me on that book. Um, you said, um, can you say something about St. Rita Candida, the female saint at Whitchurch? Um, can I call them, please? Are there any other relics of female saints in the UK select stamped? Um, I mean, it, that's one of the earlier, again, we, we have Foramina, um, she's got a great tomb. Um, one of the Foramina, you have the little porthole-esque openings, if you look, um, some tiny little porthole-esque openings, really. You'd have to be quite a small person to get in there. Um, big enough for myself, but uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, female saints that are still, well, Ely, 
this this is the point what is still in there and what isn't um is it ethel Rudder? um let me think gosh let me th i'd have to think about what who else is there um so it's like Edie, i know they're um in one of the chapels at the east end um there's the bones and not many of them left but they're basically all in um behind a wall now in one of the chapels um which um i think it was bodley um who or no travis sorry um worked on that but um yeah there's not many and there's certainly the shrine <laughs> Um, if you want to see a relic of St. Ethelgeda in Ely, um, you've got to go to the Roman Catholic chapel um, just down the road, which has her withered arm um, and the yeah. glass, uh, glass yeah. vial. England, we don't have a lot. There's more, there's more Europe, um, European. Um, there's quite a few um, European wise, and they're, and they're, then they're fully sort of, if you want to call them gory, grisly detail as well. There's quite, quite a few. Um, oh, there is, um, um, so, um, her name of York, I want to say Margaret's not my, um, Margaret Clitheroe, yeah, Margaret Clitheroe of York. Her hand um, is you can go and see that at the um, gosh, what's it called? Um, the, con the convent in, in York, someone will, will remind me what it's called. Um, on Blossom Street, <laughs> I can see it, uh, but you can see Margaret's withered hand if you want to, of course. So we'll, again, we'll try and put some of these links into these fascinating places um, after the lecture. Um, um, so whoever's asked this, um, you might want to just elaborate a little bit more, but um, you said what sounded like there is a squint in the corner. What does that mean, please? Yeah, um, so squints are officially, uh, they're called hagioscopes, um, and a squint is uh, a sort of square um i'm just seeing whether it's easier to show you it's not it's not a great photo i'll, I'll share my screen um and just one second i'll show you I'll just squint it there we go so in the bottom here you will often find squints in parish churches and there's usually little rectangular um openings within a church and they're usually um sort of directed You'll be able to see the high altar usually from a chantry chapel so it's so that the priest could um, elevate the host at the same time and also there was sight of the elevation of the host whether it's to whoever's in that particular chapel or whatever so squints or hagioscopes allow you to view what's going on at the high altar essentially so what's it's what's interesting and why i say probably a squint and you know there's all probabilities and likelies going on with St. Neot anyway but it's you can probably just see on that photo it's just angled towards the high altar if you look closely you'll see it's just angled toward the high altar behind the shrine is the Turb and Calloway family chapel this north chapel which later became their chantry chapel which we think initially was the sort of holding area if you will for pilgrims waiting to view to go underneath this arch to the left hand side of the shrine and then through and in so it's it effectively tuck them out of the main sort of nave areas and then sacred space. So that's why um, there's probably a hagioscope so that the, the Tub and Calloway Chantry uh, families could see from the Chantry Chapel to the High Altar. Um, and Emma, do you think um, then sort of um, those kind of squints, those features, I think we see sometimes those um, existing in sort of anchorite cells as well, Emma, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's two, in fact, um, a really interesting place to view this is All Saints Pavement, uh, sorry, All Saints North Street at York, um, where there, there is the, the hermitage behind, and um, and, he, and that was lived in until the mid 20th century sort of thing. So um, there's one very, very high up as well. So yes, it was also for, you know, anchorites, hermits, whoever, whoever else was there. But most often we see it usually due to chantry chapels that were in the north or south outer aisles. So you could see and everything could be formed at performed at the same time. That's fascinating. Um, you mentioned there about, um, sorry, you mentioned there about um, parish churches sometimes change their names, um, or oh, sorry, someone said I've noticed um, parish churches sometimes change their saintly dedication um, even up into the 20th century. Apart from marketing reasons, are there mm -hmm. any other common reasons? Can, and it depends really um it can be it can be for all sorts of reasons even up in, as we say until the till the modern day um i'm trying to think i'm trying to think of a good example it might simply be that there's um, they want to do it because of there's a similar local site or something like that or because they have more affiliation with a different saint so again that i would say that's probably marketing reasons arguably um there are so many reasons and uh, 
it's, it's, it's tricky because we, much of this we'd have to go back to how, and I think this is probably would make a great lecture actually, is how parish churches came to be, um, which we could say it, they sort of derived and originated from the secular system through advowsons and secular, you know, manorial lords, that sort of system and the minster model, etc. But my point here is, depending on who's founding, got the money, what the affiliations are, it's all marketing really though. Yeah, and certainly at the Reformation, um, a lot of churches across the country that were dedicated to the Virgin Mary, um, they often had the um, dedication of um, the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now at the Reformation, most churches in England get rid of that. There are a couple that keep it, and one of them is St. Mary's in Bury St. Edmunds. Um, although they don't use it, their official dedication still is um, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, and there's a couple more in that um, sort of East Anglian that I know of, but um, certainly at the Reformation, it seemed to be a lot of it was theological. Yeah. I mean, Refor yeah, Reformation is kind of a different kettle of fish for obviously several different reasons, but we still see it before and we still see it afterwards. So it, yeah, site specific. You mentioned about, um, so St. Neat's window. How old is the window? Do you know? Uh, 50, I want to say 1530, 1530, 1540. Yeah, I believe it's, Sorry, I've got this, I've got the exact date. 1530, yeah, 1530. And, and are St. Neot's relics still in Cornwall? Have they been moved to another location, do you know? Well, yeah, so, well, the story goes that um, they were taken, I think, I want to say 10th century. The, the story goes that St. Neot was in the shrine that, that I put on, on, the, on the side originally um, after his death. And then they were stolen by the Huntingdonshire Priory and taken to there and they left only um, an arm or a finger bone behind and it was that little casket which when it there was an excavation on the shrine in the 18th century and they detail what was found and it was sort of a little box with a bone in um, so that's what they found in that shrine within the north wall of of the chancel thanks emma um do you, um we've got a time for a few more questions so if you've got any do um answer, put them here if we haven't got time to answer them today we will do our best to answer them and get back to you with them um you mentioned local saints of which there were many were they all recognized by the pope in the medieval period or was the process more informal and local well it's sort of again this is a lecture in itself um i i've actually just written or recently written a paper on local what do you class as a local saint and our local shrine and it the, the process initially was a lot more localized essentially it was the sort of raising of the saints the translation that I, that I spoke about local bishops and then it became a more formalized procedure um, from Rome later on so it's actually very interesting to look at what you class as a sort of local saint what you class as a sort of universal saint and how some became so very popular and how some didn't and as I say, i've just written so hopefully that will be out later this year in a companion to medieval pilgrimage so it is very interesting to look at um how this all began and why that's another lecture as well definitely, definitely. um I'm sorry, i know winchester cathedral saint swithin is not a canonical saint he was one of those localized saints he wasn't proclaimed by the pope as being one um but doesn't yeah. mean that he's you say. But yeah, I mean, the, pr the process of canonization is later, but it wasn't initially the case, but we, yeah, we could, we could go on. on. It's a fascinating topic. <laughs> um, someone's mentioned here, um, and I'm not aware of it, uh, him being one, but um, didn't St. Albans come to be patron saint of England at one point? Not that I'm, a, yeah. not, again, not that I'm, I mean, there's Martha, um, so, um, that we, there are our mar first martyr saint in England, but I'm not aware of him being a patron saint at any point. But if you've got any other sources there that you're aware of, um, do post them, um, because I know I'd be interested in seeing them, I'm sure Emma would be as well. Um, yeah. Emma, were there some saints' bodies hidden by monks at the time Henry um, dissolved the abbey so that they couldn't be venerated by the faithful? Um, a, a, someone's written here, a body possibly St. Edberger was found under the site of a medieval priory in Bicester in, or Bicester, sorry, in 2011. St. Friedswide was buried in Oxford Cathedral when the shrine was destroyed. And if I've just crucified the pronunciation of those anglo saxon <laughs> names, I profusely apologise. I think it's Bicester. No, I don't know. Um, I, yes, indeed. Um, there, there were, there was, they certainly um, were hiding hiding saints, hiding relics, hide, 
there's a really um saint um was it poor saint claire's um the reliquary um if you want to google that um claire as in c-l-a-r-e that's a really interesting one because it seems to be um for salt but also there's a relic hidden within there so we start to see um sort of um play altar plate um being turned into or, or relics should i say turned into you know altar plate that sort of thing parish plate so that the relic bo the bones could be hidden um i mean this people still argue over whether that was you know whether it was a sort of tool for smuggling the relic or whether it was supposed to always be like that and you know the whole history of that particularly that particular artifact but we we see we thought that's very interesting is how they did how they did hide them yes bodies but a lot of times it was disguising as well because remember as as i spoke about when i in my reformation lecture it wasn't just bang here's the reformation let's hide all the relics and you know get on with things there was a lot of local change there was a change over time it wasn't just a big you know influx of change so they also didn't know what was going to happen next and i think that's why we see Theme to see, particularly in the later 16th century, relics being hidden. Yeah, and as people, as Emma said earlier in her talk today, um, when she talked about um, Arundel Castle trying to get back the relics of St Edmund, a lot of them did go over to France. And I know um, Westminster Cathedral here in London, the Roman Catholic Cathedral, um, the relics of St John Southall um, went over to France and they were brought back and returned to the cathedral when it was um, built. Um, so yeah, I think this definitely sounds doing a lecture on relics would be a, well, well worth doing, Emma. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, and I'm just going to choose this. And so if, I'm sorry if I don't answer your questions, but what we'll do is we'll put them to Emma and we'll get back to you on the Facebook event page and we'll put those there. Um, Emma, what happened, um, do you think, to relics under the reign of Henry VIII? Did he sell them or purposely destroy them? Uh, lots of different things. Um, as I said, uh, when I was talking about the reliquary then, um, the, the salt shaker, we'll call it, um, some were hidden, some were uh, destroyed. I mean, the, there's there's suggestion that um, Thomas Beckett's bones were entirely incinerated. Um, not everyone believes that, of course. Um, I think off the top of my head, that is a later suggestion. Um, so yeah, some were entirely destroyed. Lots of shrines were destroyed, um, which is why we don't, unfortunately, we don't have, for example, St. Thomas Becketts, um, we don't have Cuthbert's, etc, etc. So a lot of shrines were destroyed and therefore the relics taken. Um, but some were hidden, some were disguised, some, were, some went off to different churches, etc. So lots of different things happened and, and how and why. There's some, there are some great publications on that. I think Holy Bones, Holy, Holy Dust um, is a really great book on that. So I would recommend, you know, having a look but again another lecture probably <laughs> well, we've definitely got lots of um uh top material to cover there and um, but thank you for your questions it seems people have really um enjoyed your lecture today emery once again so thank you very much for doing that now this isn't the last time you'll be seeing emma emma's doing two more or at least two more lectures for us um on wednesday the um 13th i think it's 13th of july um I'll double check in a minute. Um, uh, it's on definitely on a Wednesday at 1 p.m. Emma's doing a taste lecture. Emma is the program director um, for the postgraduate diploma. Oh, sorry, fifteenth. Uh, um, correctly. So um, Emma is the program director for the postgraduate diploma in parish church studies, um, which is available through the University of York. Now, this is a really fascinating course. It's run in conjunction with us at the Church Conservation Trust, and it really is for people who love churches. This is the course for you. So Emma's kindly agreed to do a taster lecture for free. So you can come along, have a free lecture um, and get to learn more about what the course entails. There's details of that of how you can sign up on our Facebook events page. So just click on that events tab on our main page and you'll see it's listed there along with other lectures. And um, yeah, we'd love to welcome you there. But also later on this month for our Thursday uh, lunchtime lecture on the 23rd of July, which is the Thursday, Emma's doing a talk once again with us on naughty things in parish churches. So for those of you who know what a Sheila gig is, make sure you join. If you don't know what a Sheila gig is, Google it and make sure you join that lecture, but it's going to be fascinating. Um, again, Emma, thank you so much for joining and thanks everyone to watching. Um, 
as I said at the start, if you do like these lectures, please do consider making a donation. Um, do text CCT to 70331 to give a gift of three pounds. Um, there's a donation link in our um, event description tab, as well as a link to becoming a member of Church Conservation Trust. And as I said, if you sign up by direct debit from as little as three pound fifty a month, um, we're giving people who sign up a free copy um, of beautiful book, beautiful churches. Um, which is a really lovely book showing some of the churches in our collection. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for joining. I look forward to seeing you next week when we'll be welcoming Michael Yelton, who will be talking to us about Martin Travers and the Back to Baroque movement in England with parish churches. So look forward to seeing you next Thursday at 1pm. Thank you.